In previous videos, we've learned about glycolysis. And we know glycolysis is when we take glucose molecules and we do a bunch of chemical reactions, eventually forming pyruvate molecules. However, we can also go in the reverse direction. We can take these pyruvate molecules and other carbon intermediates and go in this reverse direction to biosynthesize glucose molecules. So this process is referred to as gluconeogenesis, the genesis of new glucose molecules. So gluconeogenesis is essentially the reverse of glycolysis. And it's important to realize the reason why we do glycolysis when we take glucose molecules and we go in this direction, the reason why we do glycolysis is to produce ATP molecules. However, the reason why we go through gluconeogenesis going in this reverse direction is to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And this gluconeogenesis primarily occurs in the liver, in the hepatocytes. It also occurs in the kidneys, but primarily it's the liver that's going through gluconeogenesis going in this reverse direction and biosynthesizing glucose molecules. So first, let's focus on glycolysis. So again, we know glycolysis is taking glucose molecules, doing a bunch of chemical reactions, eventually forming, AT eventually forming pyruvate molecules, and we know we do this to produce ATP molecules. But it's important to realize each of these steps is catalyzed by its own unique enzyme. For example, this step, taking this molecule and forming this molecule, this step is catalyzed by its own unique enzyme. And this step is also catalyzed by its own unique enzyme. Each of these steps is catalyzed by its own unique enzyme. And also what's important to realize is these steps with these red arrows are irreversible. So when we take this glucose molecule and do this step, this step is irreversible. We are not going to go in this reverse direction. However, once we form this molecule, then we do this step. This step is reversible. Sometimes we go in this direction and sometimes we go in this direction. Then we go back. So this step is reversible. However, then we do this step, which again is irreversible. We're not going to go back in this direction. And then we have a lot of reversible steps, but eventually we'll form this guy. And then this step is also irreversible. We're not going to go in this reverse direction. So, and something commonly you should realize is that these irreversible steps are commonly points of regulation. We regulate glycolysis by regulating these particular steps. In fact, the most important step you should be familiar with is this particular step, taking this guy and converting it into this guy, which is catalyzed by this enzyme. This step is how we regulate glycolysis. And the reason why is this particular step is very slow. The, even though it's very thermodynamically favorable, this step is very slow. The kinetics are very slow. So therefore, glycolysis is only as fast as its slowest step. If this step is very slow, then glycolysis is going to be slow. However, we can activate this enzyme. If we activate this enzyme, now this step will occur fast. So therefore, glycolysis will occur fast. So therefore, we regulate glycolysis by regulating this enzyme. We turn on this enzyme, and now we do a lot of glycolysis. So we also know we can go in this reverse direction through gluconeogenesis. But you might wonder how, because we already explained these steps with these red arrows are irreversible. For example, this step, taking this guy and converting it to this guy, catalyzed by this enzyme, this step is irreversible. We're not going to go in this reverse direction. So therefore, how do we take pyruvate and other carbon intermediates to go in this reverse direction to biosynthesize glucose molecules through gluconeogenesis? Well, the way we do this is by bypassing these steps. So we know this particular step catalyzed by this enzyme is, is irreversible. However, we can turn on other enzymes to essentially bypass this step. For example, we can take this enzyme to form this compound, and then this enzyme to form this compound, and now we've bypassed this irreversible step. And also we know this step is irreversible. However, we can turn on these separate enzymes, which can now bypass this step and allow it to go in this reverse direction. And also, we need to use a lot of ATP, because again, we already explained how this step is very thermodynamically favorable, so therefore, to go in this reverse direction, we need to use a lot of ATP molecules to go in this reverse direction. And it's also important to realize this particular step, just by chance, also happens to be how we regulate gluconeogenesis, because this particular step is very slow, so therefore, gluconeogenesis is slow. However, if we activate this enzyme, then this step occurs faster, so now gluconeogenesis will occur faster. So now we can see a common theme of how we regulate glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. We regulate these processes by regulating these enzymes.
So, so again, if we want to do glycolysis, we turn on this enzyme, now we do glycolysis. If we want to do gluconeogenesis, we turn on this enzyme, and now we do gluconeogenesis. But we don't want to constantly do glycolysis and gluconeogenesis at the same time. That makes no sense. So we need to carefully regulate which process we're going through. So how do we do that? Well, again, remember, gluconeogenesis is normally occurring in these hepatocytes, these liver cells. So how does this liver cell determine whether it does glycolysis or gluconeogenesis? Well, it's hormones. It's hormones that regulate these processes. For example, maybe insulin is released into the bloodstream. So then it binds to this receptor in this hepatocyte, which essentially turns on a bunch of a chain reaction of proteins, which eventually turns on this enzyme. So now this enzyme is turned on, so now this step occurs fast, so now we do a lot of glycolysis. So we see it's this insulin hormone that regulates whether we do glycolysis. And it's the same idea with gluconeogenesis. Essentially, if glucagon is released into the bloodstream, it'll bind to this receptor, which will turn on a signal transduction cascade, which eventually will turn on this enzyme. So now this step occurs fast, and so now we'll do gluconeogenesis. So we can see it's these hormones that regulate whether we do glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. And it's a little more complex. There are more factors involved in regulating these processes, but primarily they're regulated by these hormones. So in order to do gluconeogenesis, there are three things we need. First, we need regulation. We need to turn on gluconeogenesis, which we've already explained. Also, we need a source of carbons because we know glucose is a six carbon carbohydrate. So if we want to biosynthesize glucose molecules, we need a source of carbons. And also we need ATP. This is an anabolic process. Biosynthesizing these glucose molecules is an anabolic process, and we also need to bypass these thermodynamically favorable steps. So therefore, we need a lot of ATP if we want to do gluconeogenesis. So how do we regulate gluconeogenesis? Well, again, we already explained it's through, and it's through these enzymes, activating these enzymes, which are usually activated through hormones. And also you might wonder, where do we get the carbons to, glu to do gluconeogenesis? Where do we get all the carbons and, and carbon atoms to biosynthesize these glucose molecules? Well, one primary source are amino acids. So we know this is an amino acid, the alpha carbon, the amine group, the carboxyl group, and the R group. So what we can do is we can take these amino acids and we can get rid of this amine group. So what we get rid of the amine group, and when we do that, now we have this carbon backbone with this R group. Now, depending on what amino acid it is, we know different amino acids have different R groups. So depending on what amino acid this is would determine what kind of R group it had. However, the point is we get rid of this amine group. Now we have this carbon backbone intermediate. Now we can do some quick modifications to form some of these intermediates of glycolysis. So then when we form some of these intermediates, now we have these, these are the atoms we can use to enter to be used to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And a good example is alanine. So al alanine is an amino acid. So this alanine is an amino acid where the R group is simply this, this methyl group. So we can get rid of this amine group. So when we get rid of this amine group, we can replace it with the carbonyl group. Now we have this carbon backbone. Now we have a source of carbon which can be used to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And notice this happens to be pyruvate. This is simply a pyruvate molecule. So now we formed an intermediate of, of this process. So now this can enter as pyruvate. And now as long as we have the right regulation, now we can start biosynthesizing these glucose molecules through gluconeogenesis. So we know amino acids is a primary source of carbons that can be used for gluconeogenesis. Another source of carbons is lactate. So again, remember this gluconeogenesis is occurring in the hepatocytes in the liver. However, we know in the skeletal muscle, skeletal, skeletal muscle is also, also going through glycolysis forming these pyruvate molecules, which can turn into acetylcholine, and then go through aerobic respiration using these oxygen molecules. However, in certain contexts, in certain situations, there's not enough oxygen to do aerobic respiration. So therefore, the skeletal muscle has to rely on fermentation and forming these lactate molecules in order to form all the ATP it needs for, for the skeletal muscle. So now we form a lot of this lactate. So these lactate molecules can essentially be sent to the hepatocyte. So when they're sent, to the hepatocyte. Now this liver cell 
has a source of carbon. So we can take this lactate, do one quick modification to form pyruvate. So now we can use these atoms to essentially form glucose molecules. And now once we formed the glucose molecules, normally we'll send them back to the skeletal muscle. And now the skeletal muscle will take those glucose molecules and go through this entire process over again. And this is referred to as the Cori cycle. And the point of the Cori cycle is skeletal muscle requires a lot of ATP. It rely, requires a lot of glucose to go through glycolysis to produce a lot of ATP because skeletal muscle needs to contract. It needs to contract to apply forces to allow our bodies to move. So this requires a lot of energy and it requires a lot of glucose. So therefore, we essentially, essentially the idea is that the hepatocytes in the liver is going through a lot of work to create these glucose molecules so they can send it back to the skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle has glucose to go through glycolysis to produce ATP to contract and, and apply forces and allow our bodies to move, which requires a lot of energy. So we know that's the other source of carbons for our gluconeogenesis, these lactate molecules. And uh, one other source is glycerol molecules. And we'll talk about these glycerol molecules later, but this is another source of carbons that can be used to biosynthesize glucose molecules. So now you might wonder, where do we get all the ATP? Because we explained this anabolic process to biosynthesize glucose molecules requires a lot of ATP. So where do we get the ATP? So to understand this, we need to kind of do a big picture idea. So we have our liver and our hepatocyte, which we know is doing gluconeogenesis. But to do gluconeogenesis to biosynthesize these glucose molecules, we need a lot of ATP. So where do we get all the ATP to, to go through gluconeogenesis? Well, in our adipocytes, in our fat cells, we have these triacylglycerides, which is a storage form of energy. So our adipocytes, essentially what happens is in our adipocytes, we essentially hydrolyze these, these bonds, these ester linkages, releasing these free fatty acids and glycerol molecules. So now we take these free fatty acids and deliver them to the hepatocytes. So now the hepatocytes, these liver cells, have these free fatty acids. So these free fatty acids can be used as a source of energy. So these free fatty acids enter a process known as beta oxidation. And every time we go through a round of beta oxidation, we create these reduced cofactors. Now we go through another round of beta oxidation and we produce more reduced cofactors. So these reduced cofactors can essentially fuel the electron transport chain. And as they fuel the electron transport chain, we can essentially create a lot of ATP. So this is how we get the ATP. So now we have the ATP necessary to go through gluconeogenesis. So the point is we burn fat in order to create the ATP to go through gluconeogenesis to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And again, we know we need sources of carbons for, and, and again, we already explained some of these sources of carbons. For example, we can use lactate, which comes from skeletal muscles, or we can use amino acids, or we can use glycerol. And this guy was the glycerol. Once we hydrolyze these ester linkages, releasing the free fatty acids in glycerol, these carbons in this glycerol can be used. So these carbons can be used to form glucose molecules. So now let's put this all together. So essentially what happens is it's important to realize the brain requires glucose in order for it to function properly. The brain requires a lot of energy and it gets that energy from glucose and it gets that glucose from the bloodstream. So therefore, if the bloodstream is low in glucose, that's dangerous because now the brain doesn't have a source of glucose. So what happens if maybe you haven't eaten a meal in a couple hours and your blood glucose has dropped? Essentially, the pancreas senses that. The pancreas senses that the blood glucose is low and that's dangerous for the brain. So now the pancreas responds. It responds to this low glucose by releasing glucagon molecules. So it will release these glucagon molecules. So now these glucagon molecules will tell the cells in the body that the blood glucose is low. So it'll orchestrate these processes that allow gluconeogenesis to occur. So how does this happen? Well, first these glucagon molecules will bind to these receptors in these adipocytes, which will activate these enzymes that allow these bonds to be broken to create these free fatty acids. Now these free fatty acids can be sent to the liver and now this glucagon will bind to these receptors to activate enzymes to allow this, the liver cell to go through beta oxidation. So now we go through a lot of beta oxidation to create all the ATP we need. And now the glucagon will bind to these receptors, which will activate this particular enzyme, which will now allow the hepatocyte to go through gluconeogenesis. And now we can go through gluconeogenesis because we have the regulation, we have the ATP, and we have the source of carbons.
So this glucagon orchestrates all these metabolic processes that allow the body to go through gluconeogen, allow the liver cells to go through gluconeogenesis. Now we biosynthesize a lot of glucose, which can be dumped into the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. So this is gluconeogenesis.